thank you all for joining us this uh, today and i welcome you to our webinar titled the stormy sea of geopolitics and geoeconomics how will bangladesh navigate a very warm welcome to all our participants in bangladesh and around the world our present presentation today will be given by mr parvez karim abasi assistant professor of the east west university here in dhaka bangladesh as you all agree with me that we are living in very different times there is absolute fluidity in the international system in geopolitics and in geoeconomics we are also witnessing a period of fundamental changes that are coming to the international system it is very pertinent for all states big or small particularly for small states like bangladesh who are aspiring middle powers to understand the dynamic changes that we are going through so that we can all adapt and adjust ourselves particularly a system which has been compounded by the pandemic of covid-19 so, so those are some of the key issues that we shall be discussing today after the presentation the moderator will open the discussion panel and we'll have sufficient time for your questions answers and your observations and discussion we are also joined today by our organizational partner ifes and we have ms silia pesalina who is the country director for sri lanka and bangladesh silia is currently based as she just informed me in sweden sometime i get absolutely mixed up keeping track of her where in which country she is based currently but i can see you silia and welcome to you to join the webinar today and i hand over the floor to you for your remarks thank you and thank you major general it's such a pleasure to be here salam alaikum uh shubha shokal uh, shubha shonna depending on where you are it's uh, a true pleasure to uh, be part of this webinar on a very important topic so yes first of all i'd like to thank bibs for organizing this and um for inviting the the speaker parvez karim abasi who is a very knowledgeable person on this topic of geopolitics but then also i'd like to thank um the united kingdom kingdom foreign and commonwealth development office um for their support for this event as well um and um i just wanted to say that as someone who grew up during the cold war as many of us perhaps did we have a special interest in these types of geopolitics that can affect small states that are caught in between competing powers and interests and so i think today um the participation reflects that interest and so i see many familiar faces here and i i expect a very rich discussion and so and without further ado um i would like to hand it to the moderator mr shafkat munir and to um start the discussion thank you so much thank you so much silvia thank you for your uh, kind remarks Uh, good morning everyone uh, first of all i would like to thank you everyone for joining us here today uh, webinars have now become an inextricable part of our lives in this covid world but we have to make the best of what we have one year ago uh, none of us could ever imagine that october 2020 will look what it looks like right now our lives are dominated by the term covid or pandemic we are in a situation where all our countries are struggling at various levels to cope with the challenges that are before us this is also a time of great geopolitical and geoeconomic transformation many events are taking place as we speak the united states is about to go into a presidential election armenia and azerbaijan are fighting over the territory of nagorno karabakh in an, uh, fighting a war actually Uh, major geopolitical and geoeconomic changes are happening all around us even in our region uh, we still have the festering rohingya crisis which has lingered for more than 3 years and there are many other challenges which have come to the fore due to the covid-19 pandemic economic projections which were earlier bullish had to be 
changed because the COVID-19 pandemic had had such a fallout. It is very important for us in Dhaka to understand how Bangladesh will navigate what are, we would like to say the stormy sea of geopolitics and geoeconomics. And I'm very pleased to say that we have a great speaker with us today in Mr. Parvis Karim Abbasi, who many of you have uh, either know him or have met him before. He is a close associate of our institute and has been part of many of our events in the past. So without further ado, I would like to hand over to our speaker, Mr. Parvis Karim Abbasi, to tell us how we navigate the choppy waters of geoeconomics and geopolitics. Mr. Parvis Karim Abbasi, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Shafkat, for those warm words. Uh, again, thank you very much, General Munir, uh, again, for inviting me to this BIPS event. And thank you to all the assembled guests from literally all over the world who could make time out of their busy schedule to come over here. So without further ado, I will try to share the screen and let's see if the screen is being shared. Let's see. Uh, can you see the screen? Yes, the screen is so oh, we can see lovely. it. So as time is of a premium, let's start the presentation. Uh, I would kindly request all of you to turn your mics off. So again, so we're good to go. Uh, again, the topic, as we have already has been mentioned, is the stormy sea of geopolitics and geoeconomics. How can Bangladesh navigate? So before we go any further, let me give you a breakdown of the main thrust of the paper. One is the geopolitical context around the world, the state of flux around the world, and the changes it entails in the global order. Number two, we'll be looking into, again, the geopolitical changes, uh, the geopolitical challenges that Bangladesh has to face. Number three would be also the geoeconomic, specifically the more economic challenges that Bangladesh has to face. And then a set of recommendations. I've deliberately kept the Bangladeshi part. Again, I will be touching those points, but again, uh, as we have to cover a host of issues, so I'll be just briefly mentioning those issues, but let, later on I'll be fleshing it out also in the, during the case session. So off we go. So the first focus that we have is the state of geopolitical flux and the shift of global power. And that inevitably takes us to our all-encompassing, uh, pretty scary uh, COVID-19 pandemic. But as you might be quite well aware, that again, this is nothing new. Pandemics by its very nature brings about change. They're thought to be the harbingers of change, the four horses, horsemen of apocalypse. And they bring about new order amidst the chaos. And the, one of the inevitable uh, victims of this is the old war order disintegrates. And again, there are just two or three incidents that I have to repeat from history. Why from history? Because history, as the old uh, Hindu philosophers used to maintain, uh, repeats in cyclical manner. Now, one that was recorded in history was the Antonine Plague. Now, that took place in the first and second century AD. And again, it was during that time, again, named after uh, one of the Roman emperors. And again, uh, this, is, this took place between AD 165 to 262. And again, the, the epicenter of it was the then unified Roman Empire. Why do I mention this? Because the mortality rate, according to work of recent historians, was 33%. That means one in three people died from this plague. So what was the upshoot of this? The upshoot of this was that, again, the emergence of a Middle Eastern fringe persecuted cult called Christianity. Before the pandemic, only 0.07%, that's right, 0.07% of the entire Roman Empire were Christians. By the time that, again, the pandemic took hold, Christianity had become, for a variety of reasons, we won't go over there because this is not a history presentation, had become the state religion. And the pagan Greco-Roman uh, cult of polytheistic worship went down under. So this was a revolutionary change. If we go to this next uh, recorded plague, which had a seismic effect, 
around the world was the plague of Justinian, named after Emperor Justinian of the Byzantine Empire. We all know about this. Again, it took place with recurring phases for a period of 200 years. What was the upshot of this? The upshot of this is it took with it around 25 million at a lower bound and 100 million at a higher bound. That's right, 100 million people from the Mediterranean world. And it fatally weakened the two reigning superpowers, Byzantine Rome and Sassanid Persia. Sounds familiar? And it also facilitated the emergence of Islam and the great Arab conquests. So that was also a change, a massive change in the global order. That takes us to the one which is of recent memory, Black Death, brought about by rats all the way, incidentally, from China through Genoese, uh, again, because of global links through Genoese uh, uh, ships. Now, the mortality was also horrifying, 80 million. What was the upshot of this? The feudal society of bonded labor had to be discarded because there was an excessive shortage of labor. And that brought about labor saving technological innovations. That brought about the Renaissance. That brought about the distinct emergence of modern nation states like England or France. So we already get a sense based on past collation that with the, with, again, COVID-19, which has taken place really after actually 100 years after the Spanish influenza, and the way it has impacted our social behavior, our social interaction, that again, that it will have a change on the geopolitical order of things, or it may have. So let's see where it takes us. That brings us to a hotly contested, hotly debated subject, the decay of unipolarity. I'm not making a statement. It is a proposition. Is there a withering of the Western order that we had seen emerge triumphant from the 1700s till now? And has it been partially caused by the rise of China, which has been again represented by the Belt and Road Initiative? and the fascination for an alternative model, an alternative model of global order. So we'll be examining those issues. Now, it is fair to say that there has been a marked degree of divisiveness, domestic tumult, as witnessed by the recent race riots, economic stagnation, rise of economic inequality, and weak political leadership. And lack of clarity in foreign policy within the USA. The USA, after the end of the Cold War, was, again, incontrovertibly the sole power, or let's say the hegemon, the unipolar power. But in recent times, there has been conflicting signs regarding the USA's willingness and ability to lead. And along with this, it has been compounded by the rise of mercantilist protectionism and the emphasis on regional blocks and trade diversion and also damaging trade wars. Issues such as Brexit and the rift within European Union between the older established members and the Mediterranean nations or the newly, for, or newly arrived Eastern Bloc nations, those also are coming to the fore. And there we have also observed a, a certain degree of distance between the United States of America and the big two of the European Union, France and Germany. Where does it take us? So these are the questions that have been on the mind of many people who observe for signs of change. And one of the outcomes or some of the outcomes that have come over here is the track record in terms of combating COVID-19. The state of uh, response, the quality and quantity of response, the willingness of the government to combat the disease head on. Now, all of this has raised questions about, in many countries, about the durability and the desirability of the Western style, quote unquote, liberal democracy. And 
the benefits of having an unregulated free market competition? Would it be better if the state managed to centralize more power in the discretion? Would it be better if the state also supervises to a greater degree uh, the goings on of the business of free markets? So again, these are the questions that have been raised in many of the developing countries. And the less than desirable results from the American intervention in Iraq or Afghanistan or Syria and Libya has eroded again the confidence of many of the countries regarding the West or the US's ability to lead. Along with this, you have a resurgent Russia to a certain extent under President Putin, who has very effectively leveraged its oil and gas reserves and also its development and sales of modern web weapons and weaponries. And it has acquired traction in the Middle East by through intervention in the Syrian crisis. There has also been the rise of regional powers like Turkey and Iran. With Turkey, there has been a very uh, adroit use of soft power. And many say that this is a pursuit of neo Ottomanism. And Turkey has started to intervene across the greater Middle East, whether it's from Syria to Libya and further afield. And often in many of uh, the uh, policy utterances of President Erdogan, it seems that Turkey is posed as the heir to the Sunni Caliphate. On the other side, you have the Shia crusade and Iran's leadership of this. And again, Iran has also in recent times linked up with China and Russia to form up as an alternative order. So these are just some of the uh, recent developments which has been compounded by the COVID-19 pandemic. Okay. That takes us again to the alternative model which people are uh, talking about. I know that everybody knows about BRI, so I'll be very brief. That's why I said BRI in a nutshell. Now, we all know that what the Belt and Road Initiative is, that again, it is a crystallization of OBOR, One Belt, One Road. And again, this has made good use of geoeconomic strategies. And some of the broad components are trade policies, investment policies, trade assistance, boosting regional connectivity, G promoting digitization, carrying out infrastructural investment, and also carrying out complementary fiscal and monetary policy. Three themes have emerged from President Xi Jinping's signature initiative. One is the BRI is here to stay. It's a long-term project. Number two, it is very global in its vision. And number three, it is not necessarily limited to economic goals, but there is also an increasing security component. BRI in itself had created a certain degree of alarm and consternation amongst many countries and observers, whereas it has also created excitement. But during COVID times, the BRI has simply been used or turned around to focus on mitigating uh, the negative aspects of COVID-19, because we should not forget that in many quarters, China was being blamed, uh, rightly or wrongly, because of the spread of the disease. So in order to combat this, there has been, uh, uh, there has been a championing of the health Silk Road. And this is an extension of BRI in the global health sector. And China is presenting itself as a responsible global health leader. In 2017, China had signed a memorandum of understanding with World Health Organization to basically implement the Health Silk Route. And again, they had undertaken that this Health Silk Route would be implemented across the BRI member countries. So probably one of the reasons why President Trump is quite angry with the World Health Organization could be a signing of MOU. It's just a conspiracy theory. But again, what does the Health Silk Road consist of? It consists of providing medical aid in the form of masks, in the form of providing medicine, in the form of carrying out clinical vaccine trials. The Chinese government on a bilateral basis, Chinese companies engaged in BRI projects such as Huawei, 
the Triple C China Communications Constructions Company, and the charitable and philanthropic foundations like Jack Ma and Alibaba Foundations have provided medical aid to dozens of countries, and understandably so, this has been made great PR for the Chinese. Along with this, there has been a very deft intermingling of the digital Silk Route along with the health Silk Route. What is this purported reason? This is done for the sake of health monitoring. Now, digital tools have been used to monitor contact tracing and quarantine enforcement. And this has been deployed not only in China, but around the world, in South Korea, in Singapore, in Japan. China, for its part, has required some citizens to download an app that shares health data, location data, and travel data with your regional or local authorities. Healthcare codes are accessed through several digital apps, such as Alipay, WeChat, and Financial and Tencent. And they have actually partnered with local and regional and central governments to carry out or roll out a system, a digital healthcare system across the country. Now, a similar model may be duplicated across BRI member countries. Now, on paper, it sounds a very commendable issue. But again, many of its detractors point out that again, this is a sure shot way of basically acquiring sensitive information amongst uh, citizens of various countries. So again, the jury is still out. Along with this, we come to the digital extension of BRI and the great divide. Now we all know about the 5G network and again, uh, the role of, uh, let's say, Chinese companies like Huawei, who play, have played a prominent role in basically investing in 5G infrastructure network around the world. And the stated uh, opposition by the US and some of the governments in the West and the rest of the world about, again, issues of digital surveillance technology. Now, along with this, there's another uh, issue that is emerging. That is the digital currency electronic payment platform. What is that? This is a Bitcoin-like version. And this has been created by the Chinese state. And it's backed by the Chinese central bank. And it's a digital version of China's official currency, the yuan. So it is a state authorized Bitcoin, which can be a bit of a contradiction. But it uses basically blockchain technology. And a similar model using the DCEP can be duplicated across your BRI member countries. And also, we should not forget the sizable Chinese expatriate community that lives outside of China, around 39 to 40 million people. So whoever or whatever has a link or interaction, financial dealing with China can use DCEP. And this is also pointed out as China's move to internationalize the one so that it can compete with the dollar and BRI actually serves as the conduit. Now, that brings us to the other side of the coin, the yin and the yang. What has been the response from the West and the rest? Previously, there was a, a dichotomy, East versus West, but not so anymore. Now, during well it, it was more evident during president trump's time but uh, the uh, there have been even previous uh, efforts taken actually to contain certain aspects of china so it was only during president trump's presidency that american government had come out open in its head-on competition with china and it has manifested in terms of trade war to alleged to penalize alleged currency manipulation by the chinese and the straight protectionism, which has restricted market access to non-Chinese companies. It has also manifested in terms of tech war, targeting companies like Huawei or TikTok. And, and the alleged reason is because of infringing of IP rights and intrusive digital surveillance and working with the Chinese government. Along with this, there has been allegations of debt trap diplomacy of certain BRI projects. And as a response to this, there has come an Indo-Pacific strategy. And many said this has been crafted to basically 
contain the rise of BRI? Well, there's more to this because on paper it says that adherence to rules-based, quote unquote, rules-based international order and the right of free navigation. And it focuses on economy, security, and governance in Indo-Pacific region. It also incorporates the BUILD Act, the better utilization of investments leading to development. Quite a mouthful. But this is basically a platform for crowding in private sector investment. So you see an alternative model to state-sponsored investment from BRI. We are not done yet. Along with this, there has been a creation of a new federal agency, the DFC, the US International Development Finance Corporation. And what is that about? It is here to streamline development funds and it is there to address development challenges and foreign policy priorities of the United States of America. Recent developments comes to BDN. What is BDN? It is again, uh, the Blue Dot Network. And again, it's been again uh, created by the United States, Japan, and Australia. Each, every, each country has a certain degree of concern regarding BRI, and they have come together in November 2019. And what is this? It is basically a standardization and certification of infrastructure investments. So this will certify infrastructure projects around the world which meets a certain degree of standards in terms of transparency, sustainability, and development impact. So it's like a benchmarking initiative. And whenever, the, according to Blue Dead N Dot Network, if an infrastructure project gets a positive approval, then Western investors can come in and invest. Now, along with this, you have the Quad, and in this case, in case of the Quad, it is exploring options in the area of 5G network, in the case of Indo-Pacific and infrastructure connectivity. A recent case in point is the massive investment by Facebook and other uh, investors in GeoReliance. And GeoReliance is now being touted as a clean telco company and is a possible alternative to Huawei in the near region. So there is, again, a certain countering narrative in play. So I'm just setting the background in motion. Along with this, we hear certain things about the decoupling process. That means the USA is going to basically separate itself from China. Till now, there was a certain, ever since the US-China uh, uh, detente took place, uh, China had been the basically the global workshop and USA had been the tech leader. That was the understood implications. It is a rather simplification, but things have quite changed over the last 40 years. China has benefited from Western-led globalization. Now, it has become an integral part of the global supply chain. There is a mutual interdependence. The world as a whole relies on China's manufacturing infrastructure, while China itself cannot do without foreign technology. It's still dependent on cutting edge foreign technology. Just to uh, bring in a few facts and figures, China accounts for 30% of global manufacturing output. That's right. Even now after the trade war, after the embargoes, after the COVID-19, but still three out of 10 manufactured goods comes out from China. China produces 45% of the global exports in computers and laptops and tablets, and 54% of phones worldwide. Stunning. In terms of its global share of exports in furniture, is 34%. In clothing, 28%. Household electronic goods, 42%. I'm just quoting these figures. That means whenever when these when we're saying things such as decoupling process, it is a very economically expensive process. And again, the feasibility also remains in question. Even after pressure or change in U.S. policy and some of the Western governments regarding uh, foreign companies being stationed in China. 70% of foreign businesses will still remain in China. Why? Because it is too expensive to relocate. Another issue in point, 
China controls 90% of the global rare earth production and exports. Until recently, just even two months back, the USA used to basically import 80% of its rare earth minerals from China. And again, rare earth minerals, what is rare earth minerals? You all know a group of 17 minerals, which is again used elements, which is used in, in semiconductors, in missiles, in microchips, so on and so forth. And it is only recently that the US has realized how dangerously dependent it is on import of rare earth minerals. So they have basically imposed a ban on importing rare earth minerals from China, and they're trying to create their own national stockpile. President Xi Jinping, uh, with a possible decoupling in mind, has started the dual circulation economic strategy. That means, yes, they're still open to export, they're still open to foreign companies, but the emphasis is more on domestic companies and more on the domestic market. So again, that's why you see that the BRI initiative will not flag despite opposition, because China's prosperity, China's political regime's continuity, uh, again, China's prestige in the world, all of this is now inextricably tied to BRI in one form or the other. Now, let us look into certain auguries, a potent of the future. Uh, only recently, the U.S. Treasury basically issued sanctions against the Chinese company Union Development. Why? Because it was developing the Dara Sakor tourism zone in Cambodia as a part of the Belt and Road Initiative. And what they used was the Global Magnitsky Act, which is issued by the Treasury Department. Now, and this allows the president to sanction block and seize assets of alleged human rights abusers. Now, Union Development Gr Group was granted a 99-year lease to build over a, build a project that is in compass, in compass actually 89,000 hectares. Basically, they would be, build a coastal resort. It would contain housing, it would contain a airport, it would contain a port for cruise ships, and it would basically take, about, take up about 20% of Cambodia's coastline. So, and again, several billion dollars, around three to four billion dollars was actually simply targeted for this. Now, Union Development Group has been hit by the sanctions. And a key issue that has been raised by some of the legislators in America is basically concerns of Chinese military presence in Dara Sakor. And again, South China Sea comes into this. And only recently, Cambodia has found out that it is again caught between the devil and the deep sea. So it has been between US, China, it's been caught between US China rivalry. Okay. So this is uh, probably, uh, so this is probably a potent of things to come. Now, the rise of China, the rise of China also again brings about uh, uh, mixed reactions within Asia for various reasons, for various historical reasons. An example very close at hand is the recent border uh, tensions and conflicts with India. And despite having around $90 billion of trade and again, uh, growing warmth and interdependence, unfortunately, this border conflict has taken place and in the recent times. And again, this is an issue which has not been resolved. There has been allegations of wolf oriented diplomacy, such as uh, allegations of artificial island building, military drills and claims in South China Sea. So when you have countries such as Vietnam, Malaysia, Indonesia, or even Philippines, they have expressed concern. Now, for example, Australia has announced an additional $190 billion increase in expenditure in the next decade, which is a mind blowing figure. Now, it itself also feels threatened by the rise of China and is again, uh, territorial claims. Japan has a long running dispute with China in the East China Sea regarding the Senkoku or Daewoo Islands. So as a result, what we see is the Indo-Pacific strategy may find varying degrees of endorsement in the region. Now let's come to the opportunities and challenges for Bangladesh. So we'll be first of all focusing on the geopolitical opportunities and challenges. Now, we all know that again, President Xi Jinping had visited in China, had pledged $40 billion. Uh, again, $26 billion of it has been uh, touted for investment. And this has been 
uh, projected as a win-win situation for uh, both the countries. And indeed, Bangladesh has a severe infrastructural shortage and capital shortage and uh, technology shortage. So uh, if we develop infrastructure, the economy, and then we will be benefiting, it will augment our prosperity. And also, we can also focus on defense diplomacy. And this could also improve the state of our, again, this, uh, the state of readiness of our army. And again, it can, we, have with, we can then explore further uh, scope or we can explore further avenues to collaborate with China. And there is also the BCIM cor corridor. Now, again, in this case, the BCIM corridor, which is a part of the BRI planning, actually weaves through Bangladesh, if you can see on this map, and it connects to major economic routes, which can ensure national growth and security. Now, but for the BCIM corridor to work, again, we need to have, again, regional peace. Now, in this case, that means that Bangladesh itself cannot reap the benefits of BRI if there is not regional stability, if there is no, if there is no regional peace in the uh, region. Okay. And again, Bangladesh can also use the BCIM corridor, which can also, again, in the best possible scenario, and I'm saying the best possible scenario takes advantage of both uh, its proximity to India, Myanmar, and China. In, and again, it, it will also basically reduces energy deficiency. And again, it will basically ensure energy generation security. Now, what are the opportunities for Bangladesh? That was only with BRI. Now, also in terms of India, again, India is our neighbor. And we have had historical ties since 1971, our war of independence. But Bangladesh's economy is on the up. And it can, Bangladesh can act as a fulcrum for trade and investment in Northeast India. Bangladeshi companies and funds and investment can promote, basically promote commercial agriculture cultivation, tourism and power generation within Northeast India. Because often we see that again, when there's shortage of uh, certain products, either due to uh, drought or over uh, or an abundance of rainfall there is again uh, and as bangladesh is dependent for uh, import of many agriculture products so especially states like maharashtra and punjab and gujarat and haryana so again we can use northeast india basically to facilitate commercial agriculture cultivation and there is a rapid rise in economic growth in bangladesh which means there's mutual complementarities which can be explored there can be also utilization of connectivity for greater cross-border trade and investment and people-to-people -people contact. We can also explore the R&D cooperation and technology transfer. In recent times, we hear that there's a paper-based uh, COVID-19 uh, vaccine trial that is going on in India, which is inexpensive. It's been named after the famous Bengali sleuth, Feluda. But again, this is just an example that again, India has a lot to offer in terms of science, technology, and R&D. And what we should utilize, and we have just talked about what the benefits that we can bring from India, we re reap from China. It's a, it's a very positive scenario. But we should also take this opportunity to establish a distinct maritime identity, to ad take advantage of blue economy. It seems that, Bangladesh has woken up late to the fact that, again, he who has control to the sea routes will basically make a difference. And again, when we, have, we hear words like over here, the Maritime Silk Route or whether the Indo-Pacific strategy, that means, again, the ocean, the blue waters would be, again, our route to success for greater interconnectivity. Again, this is just a snapshot of the opportunities of Bangladesh. It is limited, but again, we, we can explore those issues in the Q&A session. What about the geopolitical challenges? Again, this I have again reduced it to a few points. Now, the problem is that again, it is again being caught between the devil and the deep sea. And I repeat this because it's not a cliche, it's a fact. It seems that we may get unwittingly or unwillingly sucked into the new great game that is taking place between China and USA, not directly, but indirectly. And, there, and, and one of the things that is on, on offer is again, IPS, Bangladesh is a member of IPS, Bangladesh is a member of BRI. So 
we should not be forced to take sides. It should not be mutually exclusive. Because right now, right now, both parties say that yes, you have no problem if you belong to both groups. But when push comes to shove, we should not be again to or forced to sign on to one particular issue. There's also the ongoing unfortunate tensions between India and China. Again, we have deep trade ties with both India and China. We have deep uh, historical ties with India. Again, India is our immediate neighbor. China is our near neighbor. But again, both have been, again, our development partners too. So it, we have to walk this uh, line with caution. Now, that takes us to basically pursuing a policy of strategic equiproximity. This is different from equidistance. Equidistance is a defensive approach. Equiproximity is you're engaging, but you're selective engagement suiting your own strategies and your own goals. Because if we say that we are not going to, we will be absolutely quiet, then we also risk geostrategical and geopolitical isolation. That we cannot afford to have also. Another thing that there should be a very great degree of focus on, and this is also, it's also becoming a geopolitical challenge for us, is ensuring strategic food security. What is happening is in Bangladesh, with a population of nearly 170 million people, we have food security, but we do not have strategic food security. Because in many of the cases, uh, we are reliant on import of uh, food commodities, a few vital food commodities from one or two countries. We need to diversify our import partners, or we need to subsidize our agriculture. Because again, or even there should be greater subsidy of agriculture. Because again, we also know that again, food security can also, or again, uh, the reliance on food security can also be weaponized. Recent case is in, in terms of public perception is the arbitrary, uh, arbitrary opening and also arbitrary closing of onion imports from India. Well, India has, again, its own reasons, and they are quite genuine. But again, this also creates ripple within the country because, again, uh, food inflation goes up, livelihoods are hurt. So as a result, a lot of bad blood and, uh, and again, bad blood is created, which is completely avoidable. So we, for our own good, our, for our own uh, food security, must diversify our imports. This is also part of our geostrategic requirements. Where could we get import from? And then we come to a hub of the crisis, for which I think all of you have waited. It is how do we deal with the Rohingya crisis? Now, the Rohingya crisis has been there for a lot, quite some time. And we have a very recalcitrant Myanmar. And that brings us uh, to the carrot and the stick policy. What is the carrot that we have always tried to convince Myanmar? That look, Myanmar is part of CIMEC. And again, India has also massively invested uh, in Myanmar, QQ and other, and other projects. And again, uh, there's also, they have offered a $6 billion oil deal just a few days back. Now, there has been a competing of space like many of the South Asian countries in Myanmar, between, uh, again, uh, between not only India and China, but also Japan. So what is our carrot that we can offer? Provided that, again, Myanmar takes its own citizens back, Bangladesh has time and again demonstrated a willingness to invest in hydropower projects in Myanmar the import of gas for power generation, for fertilizer production, for industrial manufacturing for Myanmar, and the development of multimodal connectivity and communication system. Because for CMEC to function, or for proposed Indian connectivity projects to work in Myanmar, there needs to be regional peace, there needs to be regional security, and that cannot be ensured until and unless the Rohingya issues is resolved. So we have to engage them on a bilateral manner through backdoor diplomacy. And again, we have to also include third party hosts to act as intermediaries or again, interlocutors to get our points across. So there must be constant engagement, but there must be also stick. Why stick? Because we must also develop our deterrent capability. So again, we must discourage any ill-conceived adventurism. Uh, 
ill conceived adventurism by myanmar and we can we so as a result our defense forces now again we are already successive governments have invested in our defense forces but our defense capabilities need to be constantly upgraded so this acts as a deterrent and again there should be a sustained pressure on myanmar in the international forum and we must always engage in the local regional and international stakeholders forum so that myanmar always faces a constant barrage of pressure because we cannot uh, relent on exerting pressure on them and again internal actors also within the region we need to also uh, think about this in terms of contingencies one thing that we really need to look into is also uh, the great power rivalry what are the lessons for bengal or bangladesh actually successor of bengal the palashi syndrome or palasi syndrome if i was a anglophone is a very good example what was it the battle is i name it after the battle of palasi in 1757 i'm sorry to interrupt but uh, we need to uh, start winding up soon thank you thank you our gracious host shafkat munir uh, uh now in this case i know uh, the i'll finish it in the next 5 minutes is it okay okay now the palasi syndrome was a very good example where again nawab sirajuddola in order to curb the power of the british east india company sought the help of the french and we all know that the british and the french were engaged in a deadly seven years war across the world and the moment nawab sirajuddola took sides with the french the british became the mortal enemies so this is a lesson that again in terms of great power rivalry we should again carefully explore our options one last thing that we need to also look into is to keep a wary eye on the spread of extremism because during times of covid again our attention is focused uh, elsewhere so extremism is not a local hub is a local phenomenon it can spread across so we need to keep our eyes and ears open and the we should also be cognizant about the fallout of the us withdrawal from afghanistan if afghanistan is stabilized or not because there will be a huge number of people who will have arms and weapons who will be without jobs if afghanistan is not stabilized so if they spread out then it's a regional problem i'm quickly coming to our end part these are the parts about uh, the economic implications of covid-19 i think we all know this i'll just sum it up in two sentences covid-19 has hit bangladesh hard but not as hard as expected because our growth gdp growth rate if our data if we go by official data is around 5.2% which is still credible and one of the reasons why is bangladesh is a large internal market and again we have had record remittance earnings but our rmg exports have gone down and one of the reasons why our record remittance earnings have increased is many of the expat workers have come with all their savings back or they've remitted a lot of money in excess during times of economic adversity so if there's a middle east crisis and there are many workers who have lost jobs so whether we can sustain our dependence on remittance earnings remains to be seen uh concluding with this i think yeah, uh, we have and again one thing that we should really uh, look out for is again the rise in unemployment in bangladesh if we and already there has been a lot of loss job losses and structural unemployment so we must be sure that again this does not lead to rise in political instability or social chaos so summing up Bangladesh does need to maintain an equiproximate relationship with its major partners. We need to cut our cloth, uh, or we need to cut our coat according to our cloth. We cannot go in into all kinds of infrastructural projects without judging the feasibility and without judging the long-term returns of this. And again, we should not be over enthusiastic on jumping on any strategic concept that comes along without judging the pros and cons. All right. we should also embrace the new opportunities that occurs in the digital realm so as a result we have to keep our eyes and ears open 
Our foreign policy needs to be supple. Our approach to defense and security needs to be strategic. And we must find a way to coexist with our neighbors because we cannot choose our neighbors. So we must find uh, means and ways to honorably accommodate them. Thank you, Shafkat, and thank you, audience, for patiently listening to my harangue. I hand over to you, Shafkat. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Abbasi. Thank you so much for your presentation.